rise to the top. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, I must change. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Tim, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for coming out here on such a beautiful day where, you know, one's time is best spent outdoors. I will, um, it's really a pleasure to be here at the Wilsonian. This is one of my favorite institutions in South Florida, along with all the other FIU museums that I do quite a bit of work with. And um, the exhibit, Promising Paradise, Cuban and Lower American Seduction, that Tim mentioned that was held here two years ago, and I'm thrilled to hear that we're going to be doing a book about it, um, is a lot of the source material that, for my talk today. Um, the, the, that, that material dealt a lot with the cultural relationship between Cuba and the United States in the middle part of the 20th century, a period that I like to call somewhat um, broadly, the Havana nightclub era. Of course, that era was many other things as well in Cuba, and many of you who lived in Cuba at the time, including my own parents who were sitting in the front row here, would um, probably think of this as, um, you know, perhaps think of that era in a different way. But from a cultural standpoint, that period of Cuban history is characterized by a profound quest among the writers, musicians, architects, and uh, other intellectuals of the period as, a period as a time when there was a great sense of trying to determine what is Cubanness. The question, que cosa es lo cubano, was very prominent among the creative class during that period. And as the, as the architectural historian Eduardo Luis Rodriguez expressed it, that, the answer to that question came from integrating tradition and modernity. And somewhat paradoxically, both the traditional and the modern borrowed from other places, including Spain, Africa, and the United States. Nowhere was this most evident than in Havana's nightclubs and music halls, and that's kind of how I want to frame this discussion today. Let's start our exploration in 1928, during the time of prohibition in the United States. In that year, a British playwright and journalist named Basil Woon published a jaunty little travelogue called When It's Cocktail Time in Cuba that chronicled the escapades of America's social set as they drank, danced, and gambled the winter away in the island that, as Woon put it, everywhere, an island where everyone is drinking and no one is drunk. <laughs> That's a direct quote. quote. The central headquarters for that winter playground was a hotel called the Sevilla Biltmore, which was built in 1906 and expanded in 1924 with a 10-story tower by architects Schultz and Weaver, the American hotel specialist who, did, who designed the Waldorf Astoria and Pier Hotels in New York, the Breakers in Palm Beach, our very own Biltmore in Coral Gables, and the Biltmore in Los Angeles, to name quite a few hotels. Wu describes the atmosphere of the Sevilla, at the Sevilla, quote, as the smartest place on the continent in January and February, unquote. He describes the gambling at Havana's Casino Nacional, and the well-heeled Americans like the Astors, the Vanderbilts, the DuPonts, and Will Rogers, who visited Cuba, as well as the cocktails that they drank, including the newly uh, created Daiquiri cocktail, and a Mary Pickford, which was in a rum and pineapple juice uh, icy concoction. At the time, Havana was the capital of a very young nation. It had not even been 30 years since Cuba had fought and won a war of independence against Spain, what Americans like to call the Spanish-American War. But that independence notwithstanding, the politics of those years were very tumultuous and fraught with mayhem. The president at the time was an individual named Gerardo Machado, who was a general of the Cuban War of Independence who had been elected legally in 1925, but afterward devolved into a brutal leader who was trying to hold on to power by reversing constitutional limits on presidential terms. In her memoir, Cuba, Island of Paradox, 
a woman named Ruby Hart Phillips, who was the New York Times correspondent, described the period as so violent and unruly that people were calling her residents in Havana and asking them when the U.S. Marines planned to land. The Marines never did land, but they didn't have to because they were already there. Like the socialites of Moon Set, like McKean Mead like and White, whose hotel, Nacional, pictured on the screen, opened in 1930, like George Gershwin, who visited Cuba in 1932 and included four bars of a very famous tune by Ignacio Piñero called Echale Salsita in his symphony, Cuban Overture, Americans were ubiquitous in 1930s Havana. American ideas percolated through Cuba's capital at the same period that its artists, musicians, and architects strove to forge a national cultural identity. But even more significantly, Cuba's burgeoning cultural markers, its music, dance, graphics, and style, were influencing US culture at the same time. These back and forth cross-pollinations of the Cuban to American and the American to Cuban is a story of modern values that began to flourish during the Art Deco years and reached a height in Havana's 1950s nightclubs. For the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to take you on a journey through this era, the scene of the mid-20th uh, mid century. But first, I'd like to offer a disclaimer. I am not an architect, and I'm not a historian, anthropologist, or a scholar. What I am, as Tim said, is primarily an architectural conservator who repairs things for a living buildings, decorative arts, the, de the frieze on the side of this building, or the Normandy Fountain up on Miami Beach. But I also like to tell stories. And I like to tell stories about Cuba in the 20th century, in part to dispel this narrative that seems to run the polemical gamut that describes that period as either a paradise that was lost, or a corrupt, mafia-driven cesspool that was well uh, destroyed. Neither of these positions is really accurate. The truth is somewhere in the middle. And the nightclub era is a good place to understand how that went. So let us return now to the 1920s. The scene is just outside of Old Havana, in an area known alternatively as either the Parque Central area or Las Murallas, because of the um, walls that surrounded the old city and were removed in the mid-19th century. This area is noted for its covered porticos that extended for blocks, as you can see here in this image of the period. And by the way, as an aside, a lot of these images that I'm showing are in the collection of the Wolfsonian Library. In the 19th century, this region of Havana was a gathering place for intellectuals and anti-Spanish revolutionaries. By the 1920s, it was a popular spot for drinking and listening to live music. Like Parisian life, which it aimed to emulate, modern Cuban life of the 20s and 30s unfolded in plein air cafes surrounded by music. All female bands, like the Conjunto Ana Gaona, depicted here in a photo of the period, and by one of their painter contemporaries in a painting that was in our exhibit, um, Promising Paradise, would play the traditional songs of the period, the boleros and Cuban guarachas that people like to listen to and dance to. Local singing, <clears throat> local singing stars like the trio Matamoros, Rita Montañer, and pianist Bola de Nieve would play to sold out crowds in the nearby lyric theaters and on the new Cuban radio stations that opened in 1922 only two years after Pittsburgh's KDKA became the first commercial radio station in the United States. Havana being an international crossroads, it would lure American and international stars of the period that would come to Cuba en route to New Orleans or Europe, invariably staying in that part of the city. Enrico Caruso, depicted here by the leading graphic designer and cartoonist of the period, Conrado Mastaguer, whom I'll tell you more about later, was one of those artists. He stayed in the aforementioned Hotel Sevilla, Sevilla when he headlined Havana's 1920s opera season and described the region thusly in a letter to his wife, and I'm quoting directly, autos, 
Tram, the tramways, trolleys, talking machines makes terrible noise. Imagine that it is a continual play of auto horn. One have not stopped, then another beginning at that all day and night. My nerves is bad. I, t I, I use that quote to describe the very boisterous and loud and noisy uh, atmosphere of that region of the city because it gave rise one particular afternoon to one particular afternoon of creativity in 1928 that irrev irrevocably changed the cultural landscape, not just of Cuban music, but of world music. At that moment, at that day, Cuban composer and band leader, Moises Simons, was sitting in one of those open air cafes I described before when he was caught by the lyric call of a street vendor. Does anyone here know what that street vendor was? Oh, okay, so the call was, of course, money. So he scribbled the words on a napkin and the, and the, um, the musical notes of the particular sound of that tune. And he composed a song that became the basis for one of the hugest musical hits to ever hit the airwaves. Mariso, and Manicero, or the peanut vendor, as you all have known and been able to say, was first recorded in 1928 by Rita Montagnier. And on April 26, 1930, it was brought to New York, to New York's Palace Theater, by the house orchestra of Havana's Casino Nacional, led by an art artist named Justo Don Aspiazo. It's Rita Montagne, and this is the Don Aspiazo Orchestra. Later that year, 1930, it was staged before a sellout crowd at the Arceo Coliseum in New York, with the band wearing, for the first time, the ruffled sleeve Cuban shirts that became so popular as a Cuban motif using cocktail shakers filled with lead shot as maracas, and with his silky voice lead singer, Antonio Machin, making an entrance, pushing a peanut cart. Probably very few Americans of the period understood the double entendre of the lyrics, which urged housewives and young women not to go to bed without tasting the vendor's hot, salty peanuts. <laughs> Nonetheless, the song's jaunty syncopation fired up audiences wherever it was performed. The first American recording of El Manicero was released by RCA Victor and sold over a million copies. It was recorded by Louis Armstrong, Guy Lombardo, and Duke Ellington in the 1930s, and was such a widespread hit that it was lampooned by Groucho Marx in the first scene, one of the first scenes, of the classic 1933 comedy, Duck Soup. Watch the movie and you'll hear Chico saying, Peanuts. <laughs> this frenzy for Cuban music, launched by El Manicero, quickly spread around the world and to all the major Cuban, uh, US cities. It lasted through the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And though the rhythm of El Manicero was a song pregón, a type of song that relies on the give and take of street vendor cries, this dance style that went along with it was known in the United States as rumba with an H. Actual Cuban rumba refers to a series of Afro-Cuban dances that are related to Santeria rituals and parties um, or street events that have absolutely nothing to do with rumba with an H as was popularized in the United States. And you can see a depiction of um, one such rumba by the Cuban contemporary photogra photography master Jose Alberto Figueroa. The new dance craze that took off in the United States was more the kind of ballroom dance that took place at the Waldorf Astoria, which in 1931 snapped up Spanish-born Cuban band leader Xavier Cugat for its chic starlight ballroom. During his 20-year tenure at the Waldorf Astoria, Cugat made it a point to introduce Cuban dance to the American public. What he did was simplify the rhythms, Latinizing the foxtrot, and making it easy for Americans to learn. We'll hear a bit more about Cugat later when we get to Tropicana, but he was an important figure in this transculturalization of Cuba to America, America to Cuba, and he was also notable for discovering singers like Miguelito Valdez, a vivacious showman who was the first to introduce the Babalu rhythm to the United States, and also a young, mild-mannered, handsome Cuban from Santiago de Cuba, as Cugat described him, named Desi Arnaz. In Havana, 
The two most popular clubs of the 1930s were both located in that same area of the heart of the city known as the Parque Central or Las Murales. <coughs> the first of these was a no-frills, dimly lit watering hole with a long mahogany bar called Sloppy Joe's. Primarily for tourists, the bar's curious name came from a newspaper editorial that urged the city's sanitation department to look into a place that was so filthy it should be called Sloppy Joe's. <laughs> but as we know today, even bad publicity is good publicity, and the name took off. The, the uh, club was uh, written up in every guidebook to Havana, and having your picture taken there while on vacation was the sure sign that you partied heartily in Cuba. On the screen, you see a slide of American movie stars Michael Todd, Joan Blondell, Cesar Romero, and Tyrone Power at Sloppy Joe's. <clears throat> a stone's throw from Sloppy Joe's was another uh, nightclub called Eden Concert Cabaret. I have never seen a photograph of Eden Concert, and Vicki Goldlevy, who donated a lot of the uh, materials that I'm showing here to the Wilsonian, has been searching for it religiously for years, and if Vicki can't find it, no one can find it. Um, but the, the Eden Concert Cabaret was located in an open-air ruin that had been the former headquarters of the aforementioned um, Gerardo Machado's Liberal Party. It was the brainchild of a Portuguese immigrant who had come to Cuba via Panama named Victor de Correa, and it had a raised concert stage under the stars and tables that lined the dilapidated charred walls with a center section cleared for dancing. The intention of this nightclub was to create the illusion of an outdoor tropical experience right in the heart of the city with a direct view from its open air roof of the terracotta tower of the newly built 1930s headquarters of Bacardi Rum, which you see pictured on the screen as well. Again, the best performers of the day, including Rita Montagne, Kugat's lead singer Miguelito Valdez, and, and band leader Armando Romeo played regularly at Eden Concert. But Victor Correa had bigger plans in mind. Those plans came to fruition one afternoon in 1939 when he was paid a visit by two men from Havana's illegal underground gambling world who had plans to open a little casino in a suburban neighborhood called Marianao. The men proposed to Correa the following, that he provide the food and entertainment for their venue, for their venture, as a way of luring patrons out to gamble. The location for this venture was a six-acre suburban estate that had belonged to a socialite of the 19-teens and 20s named Guillermina Perez Chamon, pictured here as a young woman in the pages of Cuba's social, social magazine. That same issue of the magazine featured a drawing of her husband, Regino Trufin, by Social's founder, Conrado Masaguer. By the time that the gamblers came to visit Guillermina, we're talking about the late 1930s, her husband, Trufin, had died, and she was strapped for cash. So she accepted the proposal, moved to her daughter's house, and rented her estate to the gamblers who set up their gaming tables in her dining room. The mansion had exquisite gardens also, because she and her husband were world, were world travelers who had collected exotic part, uh, plants from all parts of the world. By December 1939, Correa moved his operations out there to the Villamina estate, where he opened a larger suburban tree-lined version of the Eden Concert Cabaret Under the Stars. There are conflicting questions on how he came up with the name for the club, but many historians say that he based it on some combination of the tropical locale with the widow Mina's name, and he called it Tropicana. Imagine for a minute the time period and the exotic allure this place must have had in the early 1940s. If this was formerly one of the grand estates of the top echelon of Cuban society, but now these lush gardens could be open to anyone who had a few pesos to see a show or to gamble at the gambling tables. The president of the suburban cabaret was not a new one. Earlier, a club called San Susi had been established in an even more distant suburban locale as a venue for thematic cabaret shows in an outdoor setting. But Tropicana's site was unparalleled, and it came with the backing of Correa's well-honed uh, theatrical vision. His 1941 presentation at Tropicana, titled Conga Pantera, was a turning point in the Cuban music hall world. 
a self-described musical reenactment of a panther being chased through the African jungle. It featured a full-fledged classical ballet interlude at the center of the cabaret performance, something that would become a standard of the Cuban nightclub period of the 40s and 50s. On the screen is a much later photo of the celebrated Cuban ballerina Leonela Gonzalez performing her nightly ballet routine at Tropicana. For Con la Pantera, Correa hired his own wife, who was a prima ballerina with the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. Most notably, though, this Conga Pantera featured in the role of the hunter, the musician Chano Pozo, who a few years later would move to New York and become one of the fathers of Afro-Cuban jazz. So with that, let me turn briefly to the Cuban music era of the 1940s. The songs and guarachas of the Danas Piazzo era had by this time given way to new and decidedly modern sounds. One of these was, of course, Afro-Cuban jazz, whose greatest artists were New York Cuban players Mario Bauza and Machito, pictured here and here, and Chano Pozo, who worked primarily with Dizzy Gillespie and penned perhaps the most well-known Afro-Cuban number of the period. Anyone know the name? Manteca, exactly. Good, a well-studied well crowd. Good. So I'm sure some of you will know things that I don't know or catch my mistakes. But the most, but, by, but, but, but Afro-Cuban jazz was for listening, and most Cuban music is for dancing. And the most popular new sound of the time period was an up-tempo, horn-driven, danceable big band sound known as mambo. In the 1940s and 50s, mambo swept through Cuba and the world, popularized by the band leader and showman, Damaso Perro, and here's a, sorry, here's Chano with the Dizzy Gillespie Orchestra. And this is, a, Right. Popularized by the Cuban band leader and showman Damaso Perez Prado, Mambo filled 1950s American dance charts. If you were dancing in the 50s, you were dancing the Mambo. Records uh, were recorded by the likes of Perry Como and Rosemary Clooney. Vaughn Monroe's They Were Doing the Mambo was RCA Victor's biggest selling record in 1954, the same year that Newsweek, Time, and the New York Times Magazine featured articles on what it referred to as Mambo Mania. During World War II, when these styles were taking place, Havana's nightclub scene began to expand slowly but surely, and by the time post-war American tourism descended upon Cuba and Ernest, there were nightclubs all over the city. These places could be found in basements all over the city, in Vedado, on the road to the airport, or along uh, excuse me, yeah. or along the coast in Miramar. Most of them would stay open until three or four in the morning, Mo while many barely got going at that hour. These clubs primarily carried, catered specifically to Cubans, but a distinct group of these nightclubs, known as the Big Five or the Top Tier, were decidedly marketing to Havana's ever-growing gambling tourist clientele. Unlike in the 1920s and 30s, however, when the majority of those Americans visiting Cuba were adventurers, rum runners, or part of the high society set described in Basil Moon's book, the new clientele for these Cuban cabarets consisted now primarily of ordinary middle class Americans. Much like in the 20s when Cuba had capitalized on prohibition to market itself as a freewheeling, rum-fueled, good time haven for socialites, Cuban politicians and marketers promoted the country's exoticism. <coughs> so near and yet so foreign describes one of the most famous posters of the era by the aforementioned artist Conrado Masagué, editor of Social and Carteles magazines. Was this a tongue-in-cheek type of self-orientalization, Cuba kind of promoting itself purposely as exotic? Probably, coming from Masagué, whose drawings were famous for their sharp wit. But the irony notwithstanding, Cuba's tourist industry took this idea of the exotic Cuba seriously, especially the larger nightclubs, like San Susi, Montmartre, Tropicana, and the Parisienne Club at the Hotel Nacional. Those establishments were poised to reap massive financial windfalls because of a new law 
that licensed casinos only in places that served food and offered entertainment. The result was the mega cabaret, a high-end society charity balls, fashion shows, quinceañeras, and weddings at these places. These were full-service late-night entertainment centers that were fueled by gambling money primarily, where you could dine, drink, and dance until 3 a.m. to two or three different orchestras that alternated between Cuban hits and American big band standards. That's, um, an, uh, that's, a, um, that's one of the casinos. Uh, that, that is the, the casino room at Montmartre. I'll show you the Cuban hits and American big band standards. You could watch a show, you could watch these large scale productions. For example, in Tropicana, they would have two full shows a night, one at 11 p.m. and one at 1 a.m. that served up a kaleidoscope of performers. You can see, like Celia Cruz, who is pictured here in a show at Tropicana. I'll flip through a few just to show you what this combination of Afro-Cuban rhythms, big band music, American style choreography, and um, a sense of music uh, of comedy musical rhythms and, and including ballet look like. The first image here is of a show called Diosas de Carne, a 1958 production by legendary Tropicana choreographer Rodney that was a tribute to female sexuality based on the women of Greek literature and mythology. Of course, Rodney conjured Greece in his own sort of way. A well-known choreographer who, was, uh, who had a penchant for dramatic outbursts, and though he was absolutely difficult to work with, every single performer in Cuba clamored to work with him. What he did here is he uh, featured in his um, production number um, a, a central show, showpiece of a showgirl bathing in a gigantic champagne goblet to show off Greek mythology. <laughs> Rodney capitalized on the idea of the central ballet performance that had been developed by Victor de Correa. And here you see famed ballerina Leonela Gonzalez in a 1957 Asian-themed production, one of three that Tropicana did throughout the 1950s. A lot of these performances would also include big name stars like Josephine Baker, who performed at Tropicana, Tony Bennett, who performed at San Susi, and Nat King Cole, who was pictured here in 1956 during the first of three annual shows at Tropicana, and at the bar with the new owners of Tropicana, Martin Fox and his wife, Ophelia. As many of you know, I wrote a book in uh, about 10 years ago with Ophelia Fox that is a memoir history of this period. And a lot of what I'm talking about here was derived from the actual interviews that I held with many of the participants who were still alive at the time, including Nat King Cole's wife, who described Tropicana in tones that were near close to rapturous. She said, there was a 40-piece house orchestra at Tropicana. Nat and I had never seen anything like that before. Ophelia also described to me some of her favorite events that took place at Tropicana during her tenure there as the club's first lady. Among the best of these was the time that Liberace came to Tropicana. In 1955, he was invited to perform at the National Theater in Cuba. Afterwards, he held a dinner for the press at Tropicana, because the press had been, was very, very good to him in Cuba, and management created a table shaped like a piano in his honor. Later that evening, they lured him onto the stage with the top mambo star of the era, Ana Gloria Marona, a completely impromptu performance that one can only imagine. <laughs> it goes without saying that the modernity of these performances was part of their great allure, but they went hand in hand with architecture and design elements that were trying to set new standards as a Cuban uh, form of expression. 
a lot can be said about the Cuban architecture of the 1950s and how modernism was adapted to, 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 to really convey a very particular Cuban-based expression. But from the, I'm not talking specifically about architecture, I'm talking about all the art forms. And in, and in the uh, nightclub eras of the, of the period, Tropicana's uh, architectural campaign was by far the most ambitious. In 1951, following two weeks of torrential rains in the outdoor nightclub, where the club had to be closed while Xavier Cugat, who was the, headline, the headliner, collected his paycheck without working, Tropicana's owner, Martin Fox, furiously ran over to, Via, to the widow Trufine and made her a deal to purchase the Villamina property so he could set out to build an indoor nightclub. His goal was to build a space that would outshine every other cabaret in the country, if not the world. And, and in order to buy the property from the widow Trufine, he had to promise her one thing and one thing in particular that he would not cut down any of the trees in her gardens. The space that was designed by Cuban architect Max Borges Jr., the space was designed when he was only 28 years old. Now Borges had honed his skills in the United States where he had studied at, Georgia, at the Georgia University, um, Institute of Technology and Harvard. The, the nightclub called officially Arcos de Cristal, or Crystal Arches, consisted of six concentric, asymmetrical, telescoping, thin concrete vaults with glass panels in between. It's designed to give the illusion of being outdoors when you're indoors. And though this image is taken during the day, the way it was done was by lighting the trees outside the building and keeping the, the <coughs> interior spaces dark with pinpoint lights that looked like stars. The space included also many modern elements. Um, for example, uh, a stage that was hydraulically controlled to drop to the level of the dance floor, and the first wireless microphones in Cuba. If you want to hear more about it, you can read it in Tropicana Nights. I uh, interviewed Max Borges extensively about what his design was like, and he described in detail how he, uh, he retrofitted certain types of locally available uh, objects to be able to do those hydraulic lifts on the stage rather than ordering pre-made um, equipment from the United States that would have cost triple that much because he was so keen on making sure that his building came in within budget. Because this, for, imagine for a 28-year-old architect to build a building that is a world-class structure of this sort. He confessed to me also that he was stunned that Martin Fox agreed to this design when he presented it. Martin, after all, was a numbers runner and a gambler, an uneducated businessman from the Cuban countryside who some period people claimed was barely literate. You can see in this photo of him with Ophelia that he cuts a sort of thuggish looking figure. <laughs> But his looks belie a brilliance that was unparalleled. He was a man who understood that the greatest nightclub in Cuban history, which is what he set out to do, required buildings of an exuberant modernity, and also ones that would highlight the one feature that always set Tropicana apart from all the other locations, which were the tropical gardens. For this, he not only built great buildings, he also surrounded them with exquisite sculpture like the Tropicana Ballerina by contemporary master Rita Longa, and the Fountain of the Muses from the Casino Nacional by an Italian sculptor named Aldo Gamba, which he literally ran out and purchased in 1952 as soon as he heard that the casino had closed and was up for sale. Here you see a picture of Martin Fox with one of Meyer Lansky's associates, Lefty Clark, whose name alternately appeared on the uh, Tropicana Casino and on the San Susi Casino. In 1953, Martin continued Tropicana's building campaign with the revamping of the outdoor cabaret space, renaming it Bajo las Estrellas, or Under the Stars. Its signature element, which anyone who has ever been there knows well, 
is an abstract geometric sculpture set behind the main stage. A lot of people speculate what this is about, but I spoke to Borges and he explained it to me. He said that he designed the piece himself adapted from a series of drawings of mathematical formulas that he had seen during an Arte Povera art exhibit in Milan. It was used by choreographer Rodney as a backdrop for the, many of his shows, and also for his signature sacheting of, so, of the goddesses of the flesh down the catwalks. Another show that was done during the period that incorporated this um, element was an Afro-Cuban spectacle that was performed annually during the height of the tourist season, which was a decidedly politically incorrect performance featuring an American dancer who would go into a trance induced by African drumming and strip her clothes off, climb the sculpture, and uh, catapult into the waiting arms of dancers. After the revamping of Bajo Las Estrellas came the revamping of the casino that was located in the former dining room of the Truffine Mansion. <coughs> Here what Borges did is he opened up the walls of the formerly enclosed space and created an entirely glass-walled environment for gambling so that the patrons who were sitting at the roulette wheels and the slot machines could continue to have that sultry indoor-outdoor experience even when they were losing their shirts to the house, which they did. And this is an, um, uh, an article in Progressive Architecture magazine from the period, from the collection of Max Borges, who is now deceased, that describes the club and all the architectural elements that went into making it. There's a famous scene in Godfather Part Two that shows a group of mafiosi led by a fictional Meyer Lansky in the character of Hyman Roth dividing Havana between them. Whether those words were ever uttered in that fashion remains a mystery, but what is historically accurate is that a meeting of the American underworld took place at the McKim Mead and White Design Hotel Nacional in 1948, and that eventually, American mobsters, gamblers, call them what you will, ran most of Cuba's big name cabarets, especially uh, only, uh, th those that had gambling par uh, parlors. Pictured here is Charles Lucky Luciano in Cuba for that 1948 meeting, and Martin Fox at Tropicana with Santo Traficante of the Tampa Mob. Now, incidentally, part of the research that I did for Tropicana showed that none of those, um, that, that all of those clubs, all of those big tier nightclubs are run either by the Meyer Lansky mob or the Traficante mob. They either owned them or operated them. And the only one that wasn't owned or operated by any of these characters was Tropicana. Although, as you can see from the image of Traficante at the club, they, uh, they had certain business dealings with them. By the mid-1950s, these same mobsters were itching to come up with plans of their own that would rival Tropicana. They tried to buy it several times, and somehow Martin Fox and his brother resisted it. Instead, what they decided to do, they built something bigger, hotel casinos, with cabarets that copied the dramatic and artistic formulas that had been developed in the Cuban nightclubs. The first to open, on December 10th, 1957, was Meyer Lansky's pet project, the Havana Riviera. Originally designed by Philip Johnson, the building eventually became designed by Igor Polovitsky of Miami Beach, because Lansky couldn't see eye to eye with Philip Johnson on how he wanted the building to look. And when I show you the details of the building, you will see that this is not a Philip Johnson building by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the interiors were designed by a Los Angeles-based hotel decorator named Albert Harvin, who had designed Las Vegas' Flamingo Hotel and later became one of the primary shareholders. Harvin's design is notable for the inclusion of extensive original artwork by Cuban artists of the period, including, first of all, the, uh, I don't know if you can see it clearly here, but the, uh, the main tower of the Riviera is an entirely mosaic-clad structure. 
It's, include, it's notable for the inclusion of extensive original artwork by noted Cuban masters of the period, like Rolando Lopez de Diube, whose um, bas-relief mural lines the entrance of the casino, and you can see it here in a period photo, and a side shot of it here in a contemporary photo. And also, artist Florencio Gelaber, whose sculptures here in bronze and in concrete on the facade are part of the entire decorative plan for the building. Other decorative features include purpose-made marble and gold mosaic inlay tables that are still extant, a sculptural program along the back there that you can see, again by Florencio Gelaber, the dolphin fountain by the pool, Decorative features like mother of pearl inlay and pink naga hide doors for the casino rooms, a raked concrete by the pool area, these extraordinary chandeliers in the casino and restaurant, and this beautiful bronze sculpture that lines a staircase to nowhere that is designed only for looking at the, at the sculpture itself and where the furnishings and terrazzo flooring are intended to highlight it. The last of the great hotels of the cabaret period, as I like to call it, was the Havana Hilton. Designed by a Los Angeles architect named Welton Beckett, who did the iconic Capitol Records building in Hollywood, California in conjunction with Cuban architects Arroyo and Menendez. The hotel included a lot of signature Hilton elements like a canopy of circular lights in the lobby and an interior foliage garden. It also included the most important monumental work of art that remains to this day in Cuba, the, facade, the mosaic facade mural by Cuban superstar painter Amelia Pelaez. And here you see a close-up of the mural. It's in quite terrible disrepair right now. The building's 27-story, 630-room hotel was Latin America's largest at the time when it was built. It opened on March 12, 1958 with a grand series of parties over the course of a week. And the Wolfsonian collection includes a passport, like a fake passport that was used as the invitations, that was donated to the museum by Michelle Ogadonner, whose father had been invited to the opening. Opened March 12, 1958. In January 1959, we know what happened. The hotel became the headquarters for the revolutionaries that took over the city, thus ending this period of prolific collaboration between musicians, composers, writers, and architects. Thank you.